Hello. I would love to introduce Eric Kim, our co-founder and vice president of user experience and design. Uh, while Eric did not want me to give him an entire bio, he's a very modest man, but he is quite the visionary, and he has over 20 years of experience in design and working with Fortune 500 companies as well as higher education institutions. Um, he's going to discuss with you a little bit about creating that engaging experience for not only your institution but your students um, to create truly successful applications. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. So without further ado, I would love to introduce Eric Kim. Thanks, Courtney. So uh, it's great to be here again. It's, uh, it takes a lot of work to get to this point every year, but every year it's really gratifying to be here with you guys to see a, a lot of familiar faces and some new ones. So as Courtney said, I'm Eric. I'm uh, one of the co-founders and the head of design at Moto Labs. And as she said, I'll be talking about how we can create more engaging mobile experiences, which is, of course, a really huge topic. And I'll be covering a lot of ground, picking up on a lot of the themes that were covered earlier uh, this morning. Uh, by Dr. Hardman and Wayne and, uh, and even Stuart. And so uh, take a deep breath, maybe an extra sip of coffee, and uh, we'll dive right in. So for years now, I've been in and following online and offline conversations around mobile engagement. And of course, there's no shortage of talk and writing about digital engagement, mobile engagement, app engagement, and evidently not just a lot of talk about it, but many, many different takes on strategies on how to improve it. But in spite of that, in the one-on-one -on -one conversations I've been having with some of you and people in the office, there's a surprising amount of fuzziness and lack of clarity about what people actually mean when we say mobile engagement. The word engagement itself seems to mean very different things to different people. So uh, let's start there. What is engagement? What do you think when you hear this word? So maybe if you're a romantic, it means the promise of a lifetime spent together. If you're a gearhead, maybe it means selecting the right gear, feeling the drivetrain engage, and then pushing yourself ahead towards your goal at the optimal pace. If you're a data nerd, maybe engagement means immediately brings to mind metrics and dashboards and quantifiable trends. If you're just a, a straight up old fashioned nerd, maybe it means Captain John Luke Picard, you know, set course for a crow, warp factor 10. All together, engage, right? Lucky for you, I am all four of these things. There'll be something in this talk for everybody here. Now, when you look at these four uh, kind of randomly or amusingly chosen definitions of the word engagement, one of these things is not like the others. One of these things does not belong. Can you guess what it is? Now, three of these definitions of engagement view engagement as a means to an end as a promise of a life together, as picking the gear to move forward at the optimal pace, of engaging your warp drive to boldly go to explore brave new worlds, right? But the data nerd tends to think about engagement in and of itself as quantified by specific metrics. And I would say that I won't judge or make assumptions about our personal lives here, but in our professional lives, I'd say that most of us here are probably closest to the data nerd, especially if you come from or work in recruiting or marketing or communications or admissions, this is probably where your mind goes immediately. So our conversations around mobile engagement in the workplace tend to gravitate towards things like screen views, which Forrester Research recently said is the most popular definition of mobile success. Or this quote, which I found in a LinkedIn article written by a mobile app developer titled Best Strategies for Mobile App Engagement, which says, mobile app engagement can be defined as interaction between the application and the user for a long time. Or Localytics, no surprise, defines mobile engagement in quantitative terms as well. In this case, they say declaratively, 10 or more sessions per month means that you are a highly engaged user. And in all of this, what we're talking about is activity in and behaviors in the app itself. And I get this, it's absolutely essential. It's a huge part of the overall picture. And we at Moto Labs have, of course, invest a lot of time recently in delivering new tools to you to help you measure exactly those sorts of metrics and trends. And you can hear much more about this topic in Marshall's deep dive into analytics uh, in the implementation session tomorrow. It's a huge and vital part of the picture, and you absolutely need to be measuring how and how much your mobile apps are used. But I want to spend some time today thinking together about broader ways, different ways of looking at mobile engagement. 
So if we go back to uh, these uh, definitions of engagement and think about engagement as a means to an end, what end are we in this room really pursuing? Why do we create mobile experiences? Is it to get our people to spend more time in their mobile apps and their mobile devices? Now listen, I've got two teenagers at home, and I have to say I'm always telling them to get their faces out of their devices, out of their phones, and then this happens. Okay, so my son is 17 and my daughter is 14 in a few years, they will be your campus community. In fact, if you're in admissions, my son already is your target community. And, and Wayne talked about this with his kids as well, what he sees. And uh, you know, my son has visited several of the schools represented here in this room and will be visiting more of your schools and applying to many of them next fall, or this fall rather. And uh, Dr. Wesh will be talking about his generation, their generation, in tomorrow morning's keynote, which I'm really looking forward to. Well, when we look at this generation, we shouldn't be focused on spending, getting them or convincing them to spend more time in mobile because they don't need the encouragement, right? If we were creating, if we in this room were tasked with creating the latest game or social network or streaming video platform or some other immersive digital experience where the success of the experience is measured in time spent in the app or actions spent in the app or maybe money spent in the app, that would be a different conversation. But by and large, those are not the digital experiences that most of us here are tasked to create. Some digital experiences are created to let users escape life. Others are created to facilitate life. And for most of us, our jobs are about creating mobile experiences, digital experiences that facilitate life. And a special kind of life at that. Life within a campus community, whether it's a physical or virtual campus community, it's life within that campus community. So we should focus more on engagement and fostering engagement within that life of the campus, not in the app itself, as an end in itself. Because the engagement with the life of the campus community drives a stronger sense of connection to the campus community, which has all sorts of other knock-on benefits. Uh, better retention, better social success, better academic success, and social participation, and down the road, alumni engagement and involvement and more. So these are lofty goals. And how can the mobile app play a part in meeting them? To answer that, I think we need to think, to make sure we're not just thinking about engagement with mobile. We need to make sure we're thinking about campus engagement via mobile. Or the engagement with mobile experience, the point of it is to facilitate a greater engagement with the life of the campus community. So facilitating engagement with the life of the campus community via mobile is our goal. Then we'll talk about some broad approaches to being better at it. So I'll spend the rest of this time talking about four broad approaches and drilling down in detail into each of them where we can do better at fostering campus engagement via mobile. One is efficient utility, enhanced visibility, useful interruption, and delegated iteration. So we'll start with efficient utility. This is all about reducing the small day-to-day -day and moment-to-moment -moment frictions that slow you down as you go about your real world life. It's about providing useful, glanceable, and actionable information at the point of need, which overwhelmingly is not anymore when you're sitting down at a computer, but overwhelmingly you reach into your pocket at that moment of need to meet that need. Efficient utility is about catering to the short, bursty mobile interactions that are the demonstrated reality of mobile interaction patterns, which are very different from usage patterns that UX designers grew up over decades uh, catering towards. And uh, it's what Forrester and Google recently in the past year or two have been calling mobile micro moments. And there was an academic study published, uh, I think last year from Lancaster University that tracked actual use of smartphones and found that we smartphone users actually use, reach for our smartphones more than twice as often as we think we do or remember that we do or report that we do. And those interactions are so quick and so bursty and so instantaneous they're almost like a subconscious because they don't even register in our conscious minds. And so that's the sort of mobile interaction that we design for. And counterintuitively, especially for the data nerd, optimizing for efficient utility, optimizing for the reality of mobile interaction patterns can actually sometimes drive down some of those metrics that we were talking about, the mobile engagement metrics that are easy to get fixated on in and of themselves, notably time per session, while driving up some others, like sessions per user or sessions over time or percent of repeat sessions. But remember, we're not focused on in and of in these numbers in and of themselves. We're focused on delivering efficient utility in order to facilitate the user's day-to-day -day life. 
Now, it's no mistake that these principles have shaped our design approach and product philosophy since our team's early days incubating internally at MIT. And they're reflected in our product's utilitarian roots that continue to be at the functional heart of a lot of what we enable and a lot of what you guys deliver to your constituents. Most of our vertically integrated campus modules are all about this kind of efficient utility, whether it's shuttles or maps or dining or parking or people or courses. The majority of the screens also that we see you guys building in Publisher are about providing point of need information presented in a mobile optimized, mobile first way. Now it's not always sexy, it's not all new. Like I said, we've been talking about it, thinking about it and presenting about it for close to a decade now. But time and again, we hear not just from you in this room, but your end users as well, the app has to provide that day-to-day -day and moment-to-moment -moment usefulness in the most efficient way possible. And even though we've been talking about it and doing it and delivering it for a while, it's not to say we can't help you do it better. So one way we can deliver more efficient utility in your apps is with better information architecture. This is the overall structure and navigation pathways into your app. And for those of you who are in my design presentation last year, I'll touch on some of the same points very briefly. The easiest way to organize your mobile experience is a one-to-one -one mapping between its functional modules and the top-level navigation items. Those choices that you provide either on the home screen and in the app-wide navigation menu. But as Dr. Hartman said this, uh, this morning, that really starts to not scale well when the app gets larger and more functional, when you get up to the order of tens or dozens of uh, top-level modules. Cognitively, people just have a hard time making quick actionable decisions along a large set of choices. Response time and accuracy really start to decline at about between seven and 10 choices. So rather than overwhelm the user with tens or dozens of choices at once, you can consider um, a, a hierarchical uh, navigation where you group your app into logically related sets, present the sets at your top level navigation, so you're only presenting five or six or seven top level choices, and then from there, drill down to landing screens that then give the user access to the actual functional modules. And I see more and more schools in the past year, since the last talk and since examples from schools like UNC, uh, making that sort of uh, information architecture change, which leads to uh, you know, the topical landing screens, which then lead the user to the actual functional modules. And the, the trade-off is, um, uh, I'll go back. The trade-off is one extra tap on the part of the user, but uh, less cognitive load at any one time, and they can make quicker, burstier decisions as they navigate your app, which maps to the way people actually use their mobile devices. So another approach to efficient utility is uh, more interesting navigation screens. So we're all familiar with the trusty grid of icons, which we call the springboard pattern. But don't forget that even the trusty grid of icons pattern can be dressed up for visual impact and focus, whether it's by curation or visual impact through uh, uh, imagery and color, like in Pepperdine's landing screen for their new student orientation persona, which was mentioned earlier. And it's been gratifying, again, to see more and more of you guys exploring other design patterns beyond the springboard of icons for the home screen and navigational landing screens. Here, uh, UMass is using that tiered information architecture I talked about to group their app into six major thematic groups. Uh, which are presented with these huge tappable targets in, in bold typography and color with a small set of choices, and which leads to, again, those, uh, those drill down topical landing screens. ISU uh, has used a card-based navigation like a lot of you guys for, in this case, the orientation landing screen. And uh, Notre Dame has always been great about exploring all the different capabilities of the product and uh, basically everything that we build into the product you guys use. And here's Cal State San Marcos with another card-based layout with just a few big top-level topics leading to topical landing screens and a tiered information architecture. And here, exploring some asymmetry and contrasting color. So it's not just about fewer choices. It's easier to remember if I'm looking at the, the, for, for the red item in the top right corner or the blue item in the bottom right corner rather than navigating among 20, a grid of 20 different icons. And here are some examples uh, some of you may have seen in our own publisher showcase. The two on the, the left are examples of our latest screen type, which is called Mondrian. It's a really powerful, flexible new screen type we introduced in Publisher very recently based on a strong square grid, and it opens up all sorts of uh, flexibility and cool new visual and functional possibilities. If you haven't seen it already, we have a lot of great material on our website, and again, there's like eight or 10 examples in the Publisher Showcase with documentation on how you could build screens like that. And the example on the right here is a, uh, a home screen concept built using the collage screen type in Publisher, 
which has been significantly upgraded in the past year to where it can also now serve as great navigation or home screen landing screens, uh, as well as the long format content. Now these are all examples, uh, the customer ones that I've shown from this community as well as the showcase ones of navigation UIs that use color and asymmetry, large tappable targets, and strong visual focus and curation to make a more memorable and functional and ultimately more usable navigation screens. And with Mondrian, you can't see it here, but if you look at the examples in Showcase, you can all start, start, also start introducing bits of uh, automated motion in the feed-driven carousels just to inject some visual dynamism and call attention, the user's visual attention immediately to those pieces of the navigation screen or the landing screen which are most likely to contain snippets of the most recent content. So I'll talk more about the, uh, the mix of navigation and live content in a minute, but please, you guys have the tools. We're improving the tools all the time, and you have examples in the body of this, this community around you. So uh, please, go forward and, uh, and create more usably interesting navigation screens. And moving on, uh, still in the vein of improved efficiency and utility, another of my long-held core values is that in our products, the value of the whole has to be greater than the sum of the parts, and that's both in the tools that we provide you guys as the, as the makers, as well as in what we enable you to deliver to your end users. And a big part of how we deliver on that is having the hooks and infrastructure in the technology to enable a more holistic and seamless user experience. And Wayne touched on the, the need for that and the value of that in his talk. And so an example I like to give in years past is, you know, I look up my course, I look up my, I tap one, one tap to see my section, see my TA, can, I, with one tap I can see his details out of LDAP, with one tap I can see his office location in the campus map. And the user doesn't have to know or care if they're interacting with two or three or four very siloed different backend systems. They're just getting a seamless user experience that delivers what they're looking for seamlessly and easily at the point of need. In this example here uh, from our own uh, uh, Moto Labs employee app, I've looked up a place on the indoor map, drilled down, and you guys might have a hard time reading this, but on the map location detail, there's a link that says report a problem here, which takes the user with one tap over to the facilities app to a form that's pre-populated with that location, and I can type in a quick description, uh, take a photo if I want. If, I, if I'm signed in, it'll automatically attach my uh, identity to it, and I can submit that to an email or to a back-end facilities form processing system. Again, just a, one example, but the user doesn't have to know or care that in reality they're in, interacting with two or three very different back-end systems. Again, they're getting that seamless integrated experience. Now, we put these capabilities deep into the technology, but it does take some work sometimes to clean up and massage the data and to work with our services team on the configuration to make sure that the links actually work in your app. Absolutely worth the effort in terms of delivering that seamless and utilitarian and, and efficient experience to your end users. Personalization is another way to, uh, to deliver more efficient utility by focusing what hopefully is a growing and broadening range of uh, capabilities in the application to just a, a smaller set of choices that reduces the cognitive load on the user based on focusing on what's more likely to be relevant to that individual user at that time. One way to do that is uh, a long, take advantage of some long-standing capabilities in the product, allow the user to specify, to tell you what they're most interested in, what's most relevant to them through customizing their navigation. So out of those 20 choices, the same few always bubble to the top of the navigation or, or homepage or choosing a campus or persona, saying this is where I am, this is who I am, so I'll see the subset of stuff that's been curated for people like me. There's an exciting new capability coming to the platform in our next major release in just a few months called My Persona. That's our internal code word for it. And it's a way to tailor certain aspects, certain important aspects of the campus mobile, mobile campus experience to an individual user automatically based on the attributes we learn about them when they sign into the application. And so there's a lot of exciting new possibilities opened by this in the near term and uh, as, a, as a groundwork for the future. And Pete Akins, our VP of Engineering, will be giving a presentation uh, with Florida State University on this, I think this afternoon on that. So please, uh, please keep an eye out for that. So one last way I'll talk about that your app can more effectively uh, deliver efficient utility is via improved app-wide search. Now, a recent Google study, I think published just a month or two ago, shows that 87% of smartphone users, when they go to look for something or meet a need on their phone, they go first to search, both at the device level, at the OS level, and in the individual application. So again, we have the tools in the, in the platform to do what we call federated search, which is app-wide search across any combination of data sources and modules that you configure. 
uh, available in one tap from anywhere in the app via the navigation menu. So here I've searched for Andrew, and I found not just we have an employee named Pete Andrews and Andrew Yu, but there's a, a blog post uh, that mentions Andrew, and if you go further down, webinars and videos that feature Andrew. So federated search in one place across multiple data sources and modules. Um, and uh, then you can, uh, well, first I'll say that I know that in previous releases of the product, configuring federated search was uh, kind of needless, needlessly cumbersome. But in the most recent release of the product uh, a few months ago, we made that significantly simpler and more elegant, both to configure initially and then to maintain. So we encourage you, it's just like a checkbox to turn that feature on. If you don't have it on in your app already, no reason not to do that. And then with our new analytics tools, you can track what's being searched for. On the dashboard, there's a quick little uh, uh, portlet, and then you can tap and drill down into a full report on what people are searching on in your app, both in the app-wide federated search and module by module. And then you can use that information to deliver better search. So if you see people searching on something that doesn't have a lot of hits in your app, consider adding a publisher landing screen that is uh, filled, loaded with those search terms that can then direct them to the resources either in the app or external resources that you can link to from the central mobile app. So all these tactics I've discussed so far are focused on this, more quickly and efficiently giving the user what she already knows that she wants. But back to my original point, Let's remember that when we're more efficiently delivering the utilitarian value that the users came looking for, the measure of success is not just in how many taps or seconds or sessions are spent in the app. It's what end those taps and seconds and sessions serve in the user's lives. So you're not just focused on helping them find when the bus is arriving, for instance. You're helping them catch the bus in order to get to their class or their lunch with friends or an ultimate game or study group or a party. You're not just giving them the location of their TA's office on the campus map you're getting them to the office hours and hopefully facilitating academic success, and, and so on and so forth. And I was talking with uh, Bill from Tufts last night about the need to just sort of tell real user stories, real user scenarios, as facilitated by, real user stories about life in the community, life on campus, as facilitated by and made better by the mobile application. So think beyond the users just looking, what the user's looking for in the app to what it facilitates outside the app. So that's uh, efficient utility. It's like helping your users quickly get in gear and get where they want to go already more quickly and efficiently. So you can also use the app to suggest behaviors or suggest goals that the users may not already have in mind. And that's what I mean by enhanced visibility. If you're delivering that day-to-day -day utility and usefulness and moment-to-moment -moment usefulness, and hopefully you also have users returning to the app with some frequency, and as they're doing so, on their way to a accomplishing a goal that they already have in mind, without obtrusively getting in their way. We can use the mobile app as a property to make them aware of some aspect of community life that might affect them, their lives and their decisions in the moment, something they care about, or that you as stewards of the mobile application and stewards in a way of the communal life want them to care more about, and hopefully a combination of the two. So you can do this in several ways, one with a seasonally updated focal image or call to action or message at the top of the home screen or other major navigational screens. So for those of you who have the tiered information architecture with topical landing screens, you can do this sort of thing not just on the home screen, but on those landing screens. Here's a very simple example where there's a very brief seasonal message and a featured call to action, in this case, a welcome to the class of 2021, and a link to the new student orientation experience you've created just for them. And that can be updated seasonally or weekly or even daily. The tools make it so easy and so quick to do so without resubmitting to the store. It doesn't get in the way of the functional navigation below, but on the user's way to meeting some need that they already have in mind, this design offers them something that they might sort of stick in the back of their mind or they might tap on in the moment or remember later when they have uh, that need or, or that question. And uh, you can do something similar. You see at the bottom of the screen here, um, in the place of just a, the grid of navigation choices, we can start putting in snippets of live data, live feed-driven content. And again, with Mondrian, this can be animated to sort of draw the eye down towards what's most fresh on the screen. And so a lot of you guys have been doing this with, say, the card navigation screen type. And I encourage you to look at the Mondrian screen type and some of the capabilities in Collage as well that allow you to do more of this mixing of static content and, and dynamic content and navigation. And the informational hero at the top of the screen doesn't have to be kind of a global billboard presented to everybody as they enter the home screen of the app. It can also be topical, introduced on a specific application screen to meet a specific community or point of need. Like uh, Texas A&M, this is at the top of their transportation and parking screen. Again, a topical landing screen that leads to other properties inside and outside the app. But you see a, 
lane closures on FM60 in 2018, and this is started running last week, I think, and it'll run through the end of this week. So not everybody on campus, it's a very large campus, might care about traffic disruption because of highway construction, but you can bet that anybody going to the parking and transportation section of the app probably will care about that. So it's a great use of a, a short, timely, topical information presented, again, at the point of need. They might have not have thought coming into the app they wanted to hear about parking or traffic disruptions because of construction, but they absolutely would be interested in make, maybe change their decision based on that information, glanceably and actionably presented at the point of need. You could also do something similar with uh, in-app banner notifications, and you can see the, the one at the very top of the screen saying the campus shuttle will be running on a modified schedule for the next few days. And it's a little less visually obtrusive, a little less heavy, but because it's a banner notification, it can slide down with a little animation at the top of the screen. And you can also schedule through Communicate when that notification starts and when it automatically disappears from the screen, and whether it appears throughout the app or just on specific screens or modules within the application. So uh, many different ways to sort of introduce without, again, getting in the way of the functional needs of the user, but introduce snippets of information that might inform and help them better navigate their life on campus. Now, these are all ways of uh, elevating the visibility of timely information about things going on in the life of the community that can inform the user in a way that maybe they stick again in the back of their mind for future reference and drives future behaviors that you desire or affects them at the moment of need, at the moment of decision right now. This is exactly the sorts of things that mobile is especially good at. Enhancing visibility in your app is uh, kind of like turning on your user's short range and long range sensors. They're more aware of things going on, maybe outside their immediate field of view, but things that will improve their engagement with the life of the campus. Now, efficient utility and enhanced visibility are both ways of optimizing the in-app experience in ways intended to foster engagement with campus life, which is all fantastic, it's what we've been talking about, and it's been touches on uh, themes that were brought up earlier this morning, but it still relies on users proactively opening your app and pulling what they need out of it, right? Coming in with some specific need and, and going to the app, thinking of going to the app and pulling what they need out of it. And this requires, of course, that they've already discovered what the app has to offer, and at the moment of need, they think of it and remember to go back to the app. And we would love for that always universally to be the case, right? But we know that maybe once in a while, it's not the first place that they think of. So in such cases, luckily, mobile also has a unique ability, uh, more than any other digital communication uh, medium before it, to reach out and pool users in at a moment they might not otherwise be thinking to go there. And this is what I mean by useful interruption. Now, of course, the most uh, effective way that a mobile app can reach out and pull a user in with, with a push notification. And there's a lot to say about this, and there'll be more said about this in several sessions over the next couple of days. But I'll just touch on a few broad categories of use cases for push notifications that deliver this sort of useful interruption. These categories in, include need to know, and this is a screen snapshot that Andy gave me that he saw on Let's see, uh, March 14th. And in the middle of March, like a, a lot of our campuses, Colgate was experiencing uh, weather disasters through the Midwest and up and down the East Coast, a lot of you guys. I think we delivered like a million push notifications in one week. And it was almost entirely about weather-related stuff. So emergencies, alerts, time-sensitive announcements that affect people's life on campus. Um, this is by far the, the most common sort of use for push notifications that we see you guys uh, doing in the application. There's also asked to know. So only a few of you are taking advantage of the shuttle arrival alerts, which are kind of feed dependent. But other, uh, other ways that, this is one example of a way that the user can say, I want to be interrupted. I want to be told when the tech shuttle's coming back around on the loop an hour from now to this stop. I put my phone down, maybe forget about it. But I want the app to reach out and interrupt what I'm doing to remind me of something that I asked to know about. Another way we're going to be enabling this in the very near future is through what we're calling opt-in messages in Communicate. And there'll be more talked about this in other sessions later, but it's a way for users to subscribe to channels of messages and say, I'm interested in this, so interrupt me and let me know there's a new game going on or what the latest sports score is or something, you know, something related to the physics department, perhaps. Um, so opt-in messages will be another way that we can help you deliver asked to know sorts of notifications. Here and now. So, uh, uh, a couple of mentions were made this morning about uh, location-based notifications, proximity-triggered notifications. And if you're here at the, uh, or in Notre Dame, at the third Kroger conference a couple of years ago, you may remember the uh, beacon-based treasure hunt. 
and uh, a number of you guys have been working with partners like Radius Networks, who's a sponsor here again this year, and uh, playing with uh, proximity triggered or location triggered push notifications, again, to drive be user behaviors in the near here and now that the user might not have come into the app asking about, but which, which you think will deliver meaningful value that's worth interrupting the user for. And so uh, we're doing some stuff with uh, banners, I mean, beacons and push notifications and proximity triggered uh, alerts here at this conference this year uh, as well. So keep an eye out for that to see the here and now notifications in action this week. So finally, uh, just for me, and so again, I think only a few uh, schools in the room here today are taking advantage now of a capability in Communicate to serve as a conduit or a pump for messages originating from external systems. We have an API by which systems like LMS or Registrar can send notifications to groups of people or even to targeted individuals. And uh, so there's a lot that you can hear about from partners like Gray Heller and, uh, and others about delivering personal notifications. And uh, I'm going over notifications and messaging very quickly here, and there's a, a lot more to cover. But lucky for you, like I said, there's other sessions going on, including Brian Wolf from Maine Maritime and Andrew Hanlon from FSU will be giving a session tomorrow afternoon specifically about messaging. So we've talked about efficient utility, enhanced visibility, and useful interruption. And it's a lot of great stuff, and hopefully things that you can take home after this conference and start thinking about and planning around and, and work acting on as quickly as possible. But the last area I want to talk about is delegated iteration. And it's a, I've been laying a lot on you, I know that. And I know that in your work, when you hear something like this, uh, exhortation to go forth and do more and do new things and try new experiments, what a lot of you guys feel like coming out of a talk like this or in your day-to-day -day work is this, right? So I've had a couple of conversations already last night and this morning. You, the strategists and creators and administrators and implementers and curators of your mobile experiences, without you guys, None of what we're talking about happens. None of what any of us are going to talk about for the next couple of days happens. And all too often, it happens just because of you, because you put your shoulder into it. Right? And it's hard, right? I know. And especially when it's, it's not like the mobile app is your only responsibility. We heard people talking about it. I have three different job descriptions, and mobile is just one of them. I was talking uh, last night with Jenny Gluck, from, who's the associate CIO at Syracuse. And she's not only responsible for mobile initiatives, she also runs a whole bunch of other projects and initiatives from physical makerspaces to digital makerspaces to uh, virtual reality labs. And by the way, Jane, I think you have one of the hardest jobs in the room, but probably also the coolest job in the room. I'm just, I'm just saying. Okay, but you know, it doesn't need to be this way. You don't need to be the Lone Ranger on your campus. We don't want you to be. So an important aspect of mobile engagement that really no one else in the industry talks about is what Wayne touched on earlier, and you'll be hearing a lot more about over the next couple of days is getting more people involved in the creation and curation and updating of the mobile experience, the messaging through it, and ultimately the types of campus engagement facilitated by it. All of this, everything we're talking about becomes vastly more effective and powerful and communal and viral when we get our communities involved in the creation of the mobile experiences being delivered to them and for them. And because of the fine green delegation built into our tools, you don't have to be the Lone Ranger. You don't have to be the gatekeeper or the choke point or the person having to say no to other parties on campus or other people on campus who want to reach out to their constituents through the central mobile app because you and your team don't have the bandwidth. We want you to be the yes sayers, the hero makers, um, to enable people to reach their community members through the central app. And this can mean carving out sections of the app and granting other people or groups on campus the rights to update sections of the app or manage certain aspects of the application or deliver certain types of messages to certain cohorts in the, in the community. There's all sorts of ways of getting more people and groups directly engaged with the life of the community app and the life of the community through the app in ways that don't let them step on each other's toes, don't uh, threaten the validity or stability of the application as a whole, give each of them their own sort of domain inside the application, their own area of responsibility, and then pull them in to, uh, to contribute and collaborate on it. So delegated iteration can mean all of that. More people involved in the constant improvement of your mobile experience. It can also mean, again, recruiting students to directly contribute to portions of your application. And Stuart talked about the appathon that we had last fall to great success, and most of you have probably heard about it before. 
Um, some really exciting things that came out of that, some really cool ideas from students, again, who are by and large not developers, had never seen the product before, were trained in a matter of hours and in a matter of a weekend, creating full-fledged mobile experience that met real needs that they identified that maybe central IT or central marketing or the other curators of the application wouldn't have identified on their own. And so as, uh, as Stuart said, there are some really exciting things being planned for this coming year in partnership with some Keystone schools and Amazon Web Services about the app on at a much greater scale, which we'll hear more about in the coming days and weeks as well. So the bottom line, things get really exciting and immediate and engaging in a different way when your community gets personally involved and invested in creating the mobile tools that they and their peers will be using. And we think there's so much opportunity here for each of your schools, especially the ones that haven't really started exploring the delegation and incorporating more people, not just into the use of or ideating about, but actually creating and maintaining the application in a way that, again, people aren't talking about in the industry because no other technology platform really facilitates that, really makes that possible. And so you guys have bought into that. We want to see you take more advantage of it. And it's, a, it's one of the most exciting and gratifying things for us to think about, particularly for me personally as a founder, who first joined this team in large part to put mobile creation tools in the hands of as many people as possible. And you've heard me talk about this year in, year out, but the unofficial internal tagline for the founders was, make mobile awesome for everyone. And it's not just a starry-eyed dream or founders rally and cry. We found again and again that when you do this, when you involve students and you involve people around the community, in the creation of the unified mobile app. Some great things start to happen. Not just the app starts meeting specific on the ground needs that you might not have thought of or in ways that you certainly wouldn't have thought of. Um, but also, as you get more contributors, it's easier. You have more hands, many hands make light work, to keep many different sections of the application constantly fresh and curated in a way that you could never, and your group could never handle on your own. And the other thing that happens that Matt Wilmore has talked about a couple of times, and I'd encourage you to talk to him, or I was having a conversation just at the, during the break with Valerie from Southern Miss, about uh, the contributors become kind of natural evangelists for your unified application. So rather than proliferating many silos of functionality spread across different technology stacks and different apps and you know, bifurcating or, 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 or splintering your community's attention, you have many people investing in pieces of the central app, now driving people to the central app, where hopefully they'll also discover other pieces of functionality and you get sort of network benefits as users from different parts are driven into the app for different reasons and discover greater use and utility there. So delegating out responsibility for portions of the mobile app not only gets people in, engaged in the creation and curation, it also helps you guys with some of the other approaches to fostering campus engagement via mobile. And that brings us back to where we started. So remember that, as important as the uh, quantifiable in-app usage is, the bigger goal that we're talking about is encouraging and facilitating engagement within the life of the campus community. So I've talked about this morning about several important aspects of how that happens and how engagement with the mobile app, within the mobile app, can facilitate, encourage, and improve your users' engagement with life in their community. And so the rest of this conference is all about sharing ideas about how we can do that better sharing those ideas within this community, which we at Moda Labs truly love and to which we've always been deeply committed and connected. And you guys thought I wouldn't bring the romance back, right? <laughs> so I'm looking forward to seeing all the ways we're going to share and explore those ideas in the sessions and in the casual conversations as well in the coming days. And I hope you are as well. Thank you very much. <laughs>